ain't you glad most of you grew up in a time when daddy did sing bass and mama sang tenor? Amen. Can I say this for you fathers? It's Father's Day. I think you'll like it. I'm glad y'all know you're supposed to sing bass. We live in a generation and a time. I'm just going to say it if it offends old well. Uh, we live in a generation and a time where men want to sing tenor. Men want to sound like women and men want to act like it's Father's Day. Amen. Let's preach, let's preach to the fathers. What happened to the men that would stand up and be men? Amen. What happened to the men that would stand up and tell it like it was and not be afraid of their wife? Amen. Amen. Uh -oh. What happened to that day? Uh, we're living in a time when I just don't get it. I, I, don't, I don't understand it. Uh, I'll never understand it. The older I get, the more closer I am to my home. That's probably why I don't Amen. understand it. But I'll never understand this generation that says, I, want, I ain't never wanted to be a woman. Amen. I ain't never had that, that thought, that, that idea. I, I ain't never wanted to be a woman. I don't understand that. Uh, we got a bunch of confused men, and uh, they need to get amen. right in order to get saved amen. one or the other. All right, now that I got that out of the way, amen. amen. Luke chapter number 8, and we're going to read verses 40 through 56. We're going to skip a little bit of this, but not when we're preaching. Luke chapter number 8 and verse number 40. Everybody there? Yep. Yep. The Bible says, And it came to pass that when Jesus was returned... The people gladly received him, for they were all waiting for him. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue, and he fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come into his house. For he had only one, he had one only daughter, about twelve years of age, and she lay a dying. But as he went, the people thronged him. Now we're going to skip down to verse number 49. While he yet spake, there cometh one from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, Thy daughter is dead, trouble not the master. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him, saying, Fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole. And when he came into the house, he suffered no man to go in, save Peter, and James, and John, and the father and the mother of the maiden. And all wept and bewailed her, but he said, Weep not, she is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn, knowing that she was dead. And he put them all out and took her by the hand and called, saying, Maid, arise. And her spirit came again, and she arose straightway, and he commanded to give her meat. And her parents were astonished, but he charged them that they should tell no man what was done. Lord, we come to you this morning thanking you for being so good to us. Lord, I thank you for another opportunity, another chance to be able to come to church and worship freely. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity that I have to stand and preach, thus saith the word of God. Lord, I pray that you would help me to preach it with boldness. Take any fear or any, any of myself out of this. Lord God, I want you to fill me with your sweet Holy Spirit this morning. Lord, I pray for the listeners. Lord, I pray that they would not just be hearers of the word, but that they would leave this place different and be changed from your word and be doers of the word. Lord, I pray for our fathers this morning. Lord, I pray for anybody that may be in the midst that's lost and on their way to hell. Lord, I pray that they would come to know you before it's too late. And all these things we ask in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen. Um, so many times this story gets overlooked <clears throat> because of the miracle of the woman that touched the garment of Jesus. I can't tell you how many times I've heard a message on that. She touched the garment. She touched the hem of his, of, his, of his cloak. I've probably heard a million messages on that. But you know what I rarely hear? A message on Jairus' daughter. You know what happens? Oftentimes things get overlooked. Amen. Notice I skipped over the story of the lady with, with the issue of blood simply because it's not part of our text that we're going to study this morning. Most people overlook Jairus, Jairus and his daughter because she drew the attention. And if you look at this, she actually did. She took the attention off of, off of everything else. In the middle of everything that was going on, she touched the hem of his garment. Jesus stops what he's doing and immediately deals with her. If I was Jairus, let's be honest, I'd be a little upset. How are you going to overlook me? We're on the way to my daughter, to get my daughter right, to get my daughter a healing. And you're going to stop in your tracks and deal with somebody else. If we're in our human flesh, let's be honest this morning, we'd get a little upset because Jesus put us on the back burner for a second. But can I tell you this morning, we serve a God that never overlooks anything. Amen. Hey, he sees who you are. He sees where you are. He sees everything. He'll never overlook you. I'm glad that I serve a God in heaven that is taking care of me even when I felt overlooked by everybody else. He's never overlooked my situation. Amen. Ain't you glad for that? Amen. Now, let's talk about Jairus now that we got that in the way. 
out of the way. Here we find a dad that was concerned for his little girl. He was a ruler in the synagogue. We know that. The Bible tells us that. That means he was very well read in scripture. That means that he would probably be, uh, in our day, he'd probably handle the operations of the service. He'd have probably been the one telling us uh, what we need to do at this time, what we need to do at that time. He'd have probably been a Sunday school teacher. He'd have probably been uh, a, uh, a Wednesday night teacher or something like that. But he arranged the services. He even did the custodial duties uh, of the church. If you look into what all he did, he was much like one of today's pastors. He pretty much done everything. Of course, I'm glad I don't have to do that here. I'm glad we've got people that back me up. Amen. I'm glad we've got vacation Bible school workers that are working hard this week. But not every pastor has that. Not every pastor has the benefit of his people to help him. Most pastors are preaching uh, full preaching full time and working full time jobs and doing all the work and doing everything. I'm thankful I don't have to do that here. Amen. Amen. Thank you for your help. But this man probably didn't have that help. He was probably one, just like one of today's average pastors. He was. He, he chose who would read the scripture. He chose who would speak to the people. He was well known and much respected in the community. He had possibly heard Jesus speak in the synagogue at Capernaum, but he was also a dad. He was also a dad that cared for his family. Boy, that sounds like a real man to me. That sounds like a good father, a father figure to me. A man that's faithful to the Lord. A man that's there when the doors are open. A man that knows how to lead. A man that cares for his children. You do realize this is the only time in your Bible that I know of in my study that a man went after Jesus for his children. Every other time it was a woman. Every other time it was a mom. You think about Elijah. Who went to Elijah to, to heal her baby? The, the, multiple times, multiple women. It wasn't just one widow. Woman. He had multiple women come to him. One said that we don't even know where the father was at. If you study uh, the Old Testament scripture there when they went to try to find Elijah to try to get the child here. We don't even know where the father's at. But here we have a man that is following Jesus. Here we have a man that is literally, if you study it in context, they're walking down the road following Jesus because they're trying to get to this man's daughter. He's literally chasing after Jesus. Man, where's the fathers at the chase after Jesus? Amen. Well, I don't see him anymore. You know what? I'm getting ahead of myself. We do not know the little girl's name. She's usually referred to as Jarius' daughter. She saw his importance in the community. I wonder if she thought of him as being old-fashioned and out of touch like many teenage daughters. I'm sure she probably said, Daddy, we don't do that no more. This is, this is the 21st century. Any of y'all any ever said that to your daddy? <laughs> I know you have. <laughs> this, we don't do it like that anymore. I wonder if she saw her dad like that. I'm sure she did. There's things that my dad did, and I'm like, Daddy, we don't do that no more, dude. This is this 2024. That ain't the way it goes. It's so much easier now. All you got to do is go online, right? <laughs> All you got to do is go online. We don't. That's exactly the way that she probably saw her father. We're talking about Jarius and his daughter this morning. Father's Day. As I was studying this text, I wondered exactly what she saw in her dear old dad. I'm sure she saw more than just an old man. Ain't it a shame when children call their parents my old man or my, my, my dad, he's an old man? That's so disrespectful. And I've heard people say things like that. I'm sure she didn't say that to her father. I believe if we study his life, we'll see exactly what she saw. I'm going to give you three things that she saw, and then we're going to let you all go to the house. Number one, she saw a dad who was not ashamed to seek Jesus. She saw a dad who was not ashamed to seek Jesus. Look with me at verse 41. First part of that says, And behold, there came a man named Jairus. Notice that he didn't come in the dark of night like Nicodemus. You study Nicodemus, what did Nicodemus do? He went at night so that nobody would see him. By the way, this man probably hung out with Nicodemus. The fact that he was a, a member of the synagogue, the fact that he was a ruler, a leader, him and Nicodemus probably had some late night dinners before. Him and Nicodemus probably went down to the local Jewish Taco Bell or something like that and, and went and had lunch and they probably hung out. Nicodemus went at night. This man said, my daughter's sick. She's lying dead at home. I need Jesus. I've got to have Jesus. He's the only one that can fix my problems. He's the only one that can fix my issues. I don't care if it's dark. I don't care if it's light. I don't care if it's lunchtime. I'm going to leave everything behind and I'm chasing after Jesus. Amen. Exactly what he said. 
Not like Nicodemus hiding at night wanting to go see Jesus. Not only was it not dark time, but there was a multitude of people there. You got to think these people didn't like Jesus. These synagogue members, they didn't like Jesus because Jesus told them how to live. And Jesus told them that he was God. And anytime you've got God in your life, you're going to have to step aside and die to yourself. And none of us like to die to ourselves. We don't want to die to ourselves to live for God. We want to live in ourselves and be happy and expect God to accept us. But he doesn't until we get down off of our prideful mountains and we lower ourselves to the level that God wants us. And then God does something with us. Amen. But there's a multitude of people here. You don't see uh, Nicodemus running in front of the multitude not caring what people thought. You don't see that from these members of the synagogue, from these Jewish uh, men that are leaders in their churches. But this man didn't care who was looking. He didn't care what time it was. Hey, he said, I'm going to chase after Jesus. Jairus had, become, had come because of his daughter. It's a hard thing for a father to see his child sick. And oftentimes we think about little children. You do realize your daddy still cares about you even though you're an adult. My dad was out here yesterday fixing a mailbox. He didn't have to do that. He didn't have to so that I could be up here and do what I need to do. Uh, they, the mail, they sent a letter to the, the, to the church this week. said that we needed to raise our mailbox five inches. Uh, I got worried. said they was going to quit delivering the mail in two weeks. I'm not going to say who. But one of y'all stubborn people told me yesterday that they've been sending it to you for three years and you still ain't fixed your mailbox. <laughs> I, I thought I was going to have to get a fix. So who do I call? Well, who do we call when we're in trouble? We called Daddy. And you know what? So that I could continue to do what I was doing, Daddy was down there fixing the mailbox. Problems fixed now. Hey, Daddy cares, amen? At least mine does. Uh, daddy really cares about his kids. Don't matter if they're grown or not. Hey, I'm thankful that I've got a Daddy that will come to my rescue even though I'm 34 years old. Amen? Amen. I ain't no, y'all know I don't have the, the, the mental talent to fix things. And y'all know I destroy them. I don't fix them. <laughs> but even grown children that are sick bother a good father. Amen. Anytime I'm sick, one person that I know that will always call me and check on me is my daddy. Jerry has stepped out without reservation and fell down at Jesus' feet in front of everybody. He said, I'm going to chase Jesus. On my daughter's behalf. On, hey, where's the fathers that will chase Jesus on their children's behalf? Right. Hey, we ain't going to have a next generation unless we get some men that will stand up and be men and say, Hey, I'm going to chase Jesus Amen. with everything that I've got. You want the next generation? we got to work to get them. we got to be men. Amen. I'm preaching to the men Amen. this morning. We ought to be men that are willing to do the work. We ought to be men that are willing to be faithful. We ought to be men that are willing to follow and chase after Jesus like Amen. we should. Amen. He didn't care who was looking. He had a need and he knew that Jesus would fix it. He would just humble himself and get at his feet. Hey, some of you men this morning, you know what we ought to do? We ought to just quit being prideful. We ought to just quit saying, I'll run my home. I'm the boss around here. I'm the king of this castle. I'll rule this roost. Amen. You ought to just go ahead and say, you know what? Jesus, you rule the roost. Amen. Jesus, you take care of it. Jesus, this is my family, Lord, but you said you'd take care of us. Why? Why do we do it? Because we're prideful. We're prideful. We need to chase Jesus. Y'all, we need to get humble and fall on our face before Jesus this morning as men. You ladies thought it was rough. I get real rough with the men, don't I? <laughs> Y'all thought Mother's Day was rough. Notice that Jairus went to find Jesus himself. As I've said before, this is the only time that you find that in the Bible where a man went to find Jesus on behalf of his child. Can I say, he didn't send little Susie, uh, her sister, to go, to, to go find Jesus. He didn't send the wife to go find Jesus. Hey, a real man will go find Jesus himself. A real man will take the kids to church. You realize that the statistics are so much higher if a man gets saved and starts bringing his family to church rather than if the mom gets saved. That's what we're missing in this day is men. We're missing men that actually actually care about the Lord that actually want to make a difference in the world. We got too many men that'd rather be fishing or hunting. They'd rather be playing video games. They'd rather be playing football or watching sports instead of getting their kids to the place that they ought to be, amen? And that's right here in the house of God. If they're ever going to get a hold of Jesus, they're going to get a hold of them in the house of God. What happened to men that brought their women and their children to church with them? Amen. They didn't send everybody to church and stay back at the house so that they could get a break. They sent them to church. Y'all, I've been doing this all my life. This church thing is just natural to me. It's easy for me to say no to everybody now when it comes to church. Been doing it for so long. But he didn't send a servant. 
Did you know that the I've already said that? I'm, and he went to Jesus himself. We uh, we need more dads that will seek Jesus without shame. That would take their priestly responsibility in the home. You do realize you are the leader of the home. Amen. Your wife is not the leader. Your wife is not Captain Crunch. You are. Amen. You're supposed to be the final authority. You're, and you say, I thought women and men were equal. We are, but God doesn't ask the wife about the home. God's going to confront the man about the home. All right. All right. And you know what? God's going to make sure that if you're not leading your family, somebody else will. And when we get to heaven, if the wife is the one that's leading the home, we're going to answer for that. I believe it. That uh, Our nation is in a mess, and it's uh, because our fathers are out seeking golf balls and sports and hunting instead of seeking God on Sunday morning. They say, I've already said all that. Your children need to see you worship. Your children need to see you worship. They need to see you stand up. They need to see you raise your hand. They need to see you shed some tears. Hey, I was talking to a little hunter yesterday. He stirred my heart. We was on the slide together, and he'd always cut me off and get in front of me. And then he'd look at me, and he, he, he said, look at my elbow. He skinned his elbow. You saw that, Corey? And uh, he said, that hurts. And I showed him, I got some scrapes on my knees and stuff. I said, look at that. He, he said, the other day, I, he said, a couple weeks ago, I bit my tongue. I said, He said, I bit through my tongue. I said, I bet that hurt. He said, yeah. I said, did you cry? He said, yeah, I cried. I said, I bet you cried like a girl. He said, no, I cried like a man. You know what? I said, that's right, Hunter. I said, it's all right for men to cry. There ain't nothing wrong with that. Amen. That's what I'm talking about. We're so prideful. We don't want to see anybody see us getting our emotions. Hey, I don't care if the Lord touches my heart. I'm going to raise my hand. I'm going to throw my foot up. Amen. I'm going to say hallelujah. I'm going to say glory to God. I don't care if there's a multitude watching or not. I'm going to chase after Jesus. Amen. Amen. That's the way every man ought to be. That's the way every father ought to be. That's what we're missing in this day. Children don't see their fathers pray anymore. All they see them do is watch TV and play on their phones. We ought to pray more, amen? amen. We ought to do more for the Lord. Quit trying to get them stuff. We say, if we, if, well, I, and I've heard it all my life. My daddy even told me that. But you know what? I don't I don't have any of the toys that they bought me. Now that I'm, I got a few. I got some action figures locked up in the closet. But uh, most of the toys that they, I don't even remember them. And you say, oh, the stuff. We got to get them stuff. I want them to have, I want them to have what I didn't have growing up. That's good. But if you didn't have Jesus, you need to give them Jesus. Amen. What good does it do to give them all that stuff if you're not giving them Jesus? <laughs> By the way, at the end, when everything's said and done, all that stuff ain't going to matter. Amen. The only thing that's going to matter is their relationship with the Lord. Amen. Most parents take their eye off the ball. They've got their kids in t-ball. They've got their kids in soccer. They've got their kids in this. and They've got them in everything else. And everything else takes precedence over their life because they think they're going to be NFL stars and they think they're going to be NBA stars. i got news for you. It ain't going to be likely. Amen. It ain't likely that they're going to do that. But I'll tell you what, if you get them in church, there's a 100% chance that when they grow old, it will not depart from them. Amen. That's right. It will not depart from them. That's what the Bible says. What a difference it would make if our fathers would just seek Jesus this morning. Number two, he was not ashamed to bring Jesus to the house. He was not ashamed to bring Jesus to the house. Look with me again at verse number 41. Behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue, and he fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come into his house. Notice that the event that followed was as he went. He's literally, this crowd, this whole crowd of people is following the Lord. As Jairus and the Lord are standing side by side, look, Jairus is leading him to where he needs to go. And this whole crowd of people is following him because they want to see Jesus do this miracle. He's literally chasing after Jesus. Literally chasing after Jesus. Can you imagine the phone call? Notice this whole crowd's on the way to their house. Now, I know they didn't have phones back then, but let's use our imaginations this morning. Honey, I'm bringing a huge crowd to the house. You're going to have to cook for them. You imagine that phone call? I assume when they, when they, when they pulled up, wifey's like, Oh Lord, I gotta feed all these people. What am I gonna do? Usually, usually we don't we don't we don't give warning and we wait till the last minute. But I could just imagine what she was thinking. But we need more dads who would bring Jesus to the house. Amen. We need more dads uh, who would stand with Joshua and declare to the world, "For as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord." 
We need men uh, who would lead their families in prayer at the table. Just not just relegate the responsibility to the kids. And say, oh, Sonny, you want to pray? Good food, good meat. Let's eat. Amen. That's most. That's most prayers around the table at the house. You're right. We need more men that will take time and pray and let their kids hear them pray. You say, why don't children uh, know how to pray? Because their parents don't pray. That's right. Amen. You know, we had one out here yesterday, and I won't. I don't. I won't say the name or anything. But she said I was going down that slide. She's probably no more than five years old. She said I was going down that slide, and I was screaming like H word. Little five year old. You say, oh, I'm shocked. Well, what do you expect when the parents talk like that? Amen. Amen. What do you expect when you talk like that? How do you expect your kids to learn? How do you think we learn? How do you think kids, not we, I ain't a kid no more. How do you think kids learn, even though I am a big kid? How do you think kids learn what to say and what to do? By the way, they will repeat everything that you say. Amen. They're like a, a parrot. Amen. You don't want things said, they'll say it. Yes, amen. Dad, you want to bless your family? Lead them in prayer at your next meal. You'll grow a foot taller in their eyes. Dad, Dad, we need dads who would invite Jesus in the home by reading his word. We don't have dads that do that anymore. Whatever happened to the, and I believe in, in, in uh, individual prayer. I believe there's no better, no better prayer life than, than the pr prayer closet. Personal prayer is what you, what you need most. But I also believe we need families that will gather together and do devotions together, and read their Bibles together, and pray together. You know what? It's the dad's responsibility to get that together, not the mother's. Matthew chapter 9, verse 18 says it this way, There came a certain ruler and worshipped him. He worshipped him. When was the last time you worshipped Jesus in front of your children? When was the last time you worshipped Jesus in front of your grandchildren? Dads, let, let your kids see you honoring the Lord. I promise you it'll make a difference in their life and yours. Take them to church. Read the word with them. Pray. Living for Jesus. We need more dads who would invite Jesus to their house. Number three, and we're done. He was not ashamed to put the welfare, welfare of, his, of his child in the hands of Jesus. As we read the rest of this chapter, let's look at verse 49 again through 56. While he yet spake, there cometh one from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, Thy daughter is dead. Trouble not the master. Verse 50. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him, saying, Fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole. And when he came into the house, he suffered no man to go in, save Peter and James and John and the father and the mother of Maiden. And this is not in my outline, but the Lord just give it to me. Sometimes you just need to go ahead and get your children around the man of God. Notice, nobody else, he wouldn't allow, he didn't say Jesus wouldn't allow men. Jairus wouldn't allow men. He wasn't going to let them go in the house because he wanted them to get a touch from the, from the men of God, from the preachers of that day. You know what? Your kids need preaching. Amen. You want to know why I am the way that I am today? Because I grew up in a preaching church. They preached to us in teen church. They didn't give us no little devotional. They, they didn't give, read no little five-minute devotional. They came in and they blasted us. And they told us like it was. From the time I was uh, 11 years old up, I got saved when I was 12. I was in teen church. I was in uh, junior church. And they told it like it was. They didn't hold back. That's what our kids need more of in this day. Amen. Amen. Verse number 52. And all wept and bewailed her, but he said, Weep not, she is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn, knowing that she was dead. And he put them all out and took her by the hand and called, saying, May arise. And her spirit came again, and she arose straightway, and he commanded to give her meat. And her parents were astonished, but he charged them that they should tell no man what was done. You know what I find amazing in that passage before I move on to my outline? They were astonished. I thought Jairus knew Jesus could heal. Why was he astonished that Jesus did what he asked him to do? You know what? We ought not to be surprised when God does exactly what we ask him to do. Right. We ought not to be, whoo, it, it, it's a miracle. Jesus said he could do all things. He said, I can do it all. He said, come to me. You have not because you ask not. Moving on. We need dads who will dedicate their children to the Lord, who will lead their children to seek God's will for their lives. I was going in, the dire in, in a direction that my dad wanted me to, did, wanted me to go. Uh, and, but when I turned around, I'm going to be honest with you. As a young boy, when God called me to preach, I knew that was what I was supposed to do. My dad wanted me to go off and work with him and go out of town with him. He was a, a cable uh, line barrier at that time. Boy, that's hard work. 
And I did it for a little bit, and I did not like it. I'm too lazy for that stuff. I admit it, I'm lazy. Miss Jean, see where I'm at. I admit it, I'm lazy. He'd take that man killer and he'd dig a hole. And he'd, he'd, I'd have to do that and about kill me. And that's rough work. I said, I ain't going to do no outside work. Joe, you like outside work? I didn't ask you if you do it every day. I said, do you like it? Not really. See, I'm not the only one. He does it, but he don't like it. I, I'm smart enough not to do it. <laughs> I told Jean this morning, she said, I get out in the yard and dig. I said, I'm smart enough. I don't do that. I cover it with cement, so I ain't got to. <laughs> Praise God. I got more sense than that. Just kidding. Just kidding. But for real, he, he was a cable bird. He'd be out of town all the time. God called me to preach. I knew I wasn't. I wasn't going to get what I needed if I went out of town with him. I, he wasn't at church back then. My daddy was saved, but he wasn't, he wasn't putting the Lord first. It was, it was money. It was the family. And, you know, most dads do that. And I'm thankful that, that, that we had money, and I'm thankful that we had things. But uh, he, he was out of town all the time. I knew I wouldn't be at church. I wouldn't get what I needed as a 16-year-old boy. And uh, I told him I'm moving out. I said, I, I'm not, I'm not, I, I can't, can't do what you want me to do. And I moved in with a preacher and started paying rent. And from that on, I've been on my own. But I did not go in the direction that my dad wanted me to go. Most dads want their kids to follow them in their footsteps. Every day, every kid ain't going to do that. That's right. you got to give it over to the Lord. You know, you can't expect your kids to be you. The Bible says to train up a child in the way he should go, and it shall not depart from him. It also tells us in the, that says that in the way he should go. Not the way you want him to go. Not the direction you think he ought to go. But train up a child in the way he should go. He should go. Amen. God may call them to do something completely different than what you want them to do. You've got to learn to give that to them. That's what Jerry's had to do here. He had to give his daughter up. Most parents are all right if their kids come to vacation Bible school and they get saved and they get baptized. Woo, they're going to heaven. Hallelujah. But when it comes time for that child to be a missionary, then it becomes a problem. You can't do that. You've got to have common sense. The world's dangerous. The world, they'll chew you up and spit you out. That's what most parents tell their kids. Oh, we, we want our kids to, uh, to, to, to grow up to be strong men, but then it becomes a problem when they want to go into the military. You say, you'll get shot, you'll get killed. No, somebody's got somebody's to fight for the country. That's right. somebody, everybody can't do it, but somebody's got to do it. And it may be your child, and you say, well, that ain't the direction I had planned for them. Doesn't matter. It might be God's direction. That's you right. ought to encourage that child in the direction that they need to go, not the direction that you want to go. Amen. Right. Too many dads want their kids to do this or do that. What if that ain't what God wants them to do? He had to give his daughter to the Lord so that he could heal her, so that he could fix her. Uh, I remember when I was a teenager, my, I would have said that. Much like Abraham, dads must be willing to sacrifice their children on the altar of God's plan. You think about that. When we study Abraham and Isaac and we look at the life that Abraham had, you say, I would never do that. Abraham was going to do it. Isaac's laying there on wood. There's no sacrifice. Isaac, we preached on this a few weeks ago. Isaac's looking around. And he says, where's the, where's, the, where's the ram, Dad? Where's the sacrifice? And Abraham never did tell him, but Isaac just laid there. And Abraham said, God will provide himself a lamb, a ram. But Isaac laid there. And as Isaac's laying there, Abraham's got his knife out. He's getting ready to slit his son's, son's throat. You say, I'd never do that. Huh? You're not willing to sacrifice your kids for the Lord. They'll never get where they need to be. Amen. Abraham took that knife. He was getting ready to cut the throat of his son. And all of a sudden, the angel stepped out and said, You know, Abraham, don't do it. Don't do it. God knew he wasn't going to lose that child. Abraham didn't. Abraham, where's the man that's willing to sacrifice? Their children. We're fine. Like I said, we're fine with them getting saved. But when they get dedicated, it becomes a problem. When they're not able to make it to Father's Day dinner because of church, that becomes a problem. It ought not to be a problem. Your children ought to put God first. You ought to be happy about that. Amen. God has a plan. It was God's plan that this little 12-year-old live, and I'm thankful for that. Amen. Look what Jesus said in verse number 50. But when Jesus heard it, ain't you glad he hears? Amen. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him saying, Fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole. Don't be afraid for your children's sake. You say, I grew I raised them in church. They know what they're supposed to be doing, but they're not doing it. You know what? God's going to get a hold of them one way or another. Of course, that's one fear that I, I will want God to get a hold of my child in a, in a wrong way. 
But you've got to be willing to sacrifice them. In order for them to give God everything that they've got, you, you dads, you've got to give it up. You've got to give it up. You've got to take the reins off, and you've got to let them handle it. Only believe, trust God, she'll be made well. Jairus completely put his daughter in the hands of God's care. Fathers, you can't dictate every step your children make. Amen. You, you can't. You've got to let them grow. You've got to let them do it. And I know it, it's hard. My dad's the same way. He gives me advice all the time. And you know what? I don't always listen to it. I should because daddy's smart. Daddy's been through it. But I'm stubborn. Amen. I'm bullheaded. Amen. I'll be honest with you. I think I know it all sometimes. But just don't give up on your kids. Don't quit praying for them. Don't quit seeking God on their behalf. I promise you one day it's going to click in their head. And they'll get it. They'll get it. In uh, closing, we're done. Dads, what do your children see in you? Do they see you ashamed? Do they see your unfaithfulness? Do they see you as a person that doesn't care about God? How does your child look at you when it comes to the things of God? Do they see a dad who's not ashamed to seek the Lord? Do they see a dad who's not ashamed to bring Jesus into the house? Do they see a dad who prays for him and commits him into the hands of the Lord? Romans 1.16, as Brooks coming to the piano, says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I am not ashamed of Jesus. Men, you ought not to be ashamed of Jesus. Not only in your mental in your mental ideas and in your ideology, but also in your actions. You do realize that when we don't uh, when we don't do as God asks, by our actions we're saying I'm ashamed. By our actions we're saying I don't believe. Because if we really believe, we would come with a bold spirit. We would do everything that we could to be fathers and men uh, that God and our children children would be proud of. Everybody stay.